Aloha, I'm Carolyn Tanaka and welcome to Live at the Legislature. Every week we'll be sitting down with members of the House of Representatives to talk about issues and legislation moving through the state capitol this year. With us this morning is Representative Linda Ichiyama and we are going to be talking about the Women's Legislative Caucus package of bills that you announced just last week. Um, I think we're looking at about 15 bills and if we had to categorize them, we're looking at bills that focus on um, access to health care for women, bills that address um, violence against women, and also bills that look at economic opportunities for women. So Representative Ichiyama, why don't we start a bit and there's 15 bills, we can't go through all of them. So in the healthcare area, there is a bill that talks about comprehensive coverage of reproductive health services for women. Can you explain it a little bit and tell us why we need it? Sure, thank you very much for having me on this morning. So the bill would require that all health insurers cover uh, all forms of reproductive healthcare services from contraceptive services to supplies, including abortion. And, and why is it needed? At the federal level, there's been so much change in health care, you know, whether Obamacare is going to be repealed, changing executive orders, and there's a lot of uncertainty. And in Hawaii, we wanted to make sure as, as the first state to legalize abortion that women always had the access that they need to reproductive health care. And so this bill ensures that by putting it into state law. Okay, that sounds good. What about in the area of violence against women? Um, as we know, that has been in the news, sexual harassment, sexual assaults on women, uh, and we will get into that hopefully more if we have time. But one of the bills that um, you are proposing this year is involves the rape kit backlog. Can you tell us a little bit about that bill? So in 2016, the legislature passed a law to require an inventory of all kits because we didn't know how many rape, rape kits we had. And so it required all law enforcement agencies statewide to do an inventory and then do an report to the attorney general. Mm -hmm. We discovered that, and we weren't really surprised to, to find out that there were over a thousand untested rape kits that were sitting on the shelves in the hands of law enforcement. And this was particularly troubling because not only do each of these kits represent a victim, somebody who went through the process of having the kit collected, but also because these kits represent potential evidence that can uh, solve unsolved crimes, exonerate the innocent, mm -hmm. and eventually, ultimately, catch what we know to be serial rapists. And this particular bill, House Bill 2131, um, can you put it into context with that 2016 report? Why, do, why this bill this year? Sure, that's a great question. And so the uh, progress that has been made on the kits that have uh, been sitting on the shelves, the eligible kits that were, that were eligible for testing have been submitted for testing. But the purpose of the bill this year is to make sure that we never have a backlog ever again. So it sets up, it sets up mandatory time frames for law enforcement to collect kits, to submit them to testing, to upload DNA profiles into CODIS. It also establishes a framework for a tracking system so that victims know what happened to their kid and where it's at. Because one of the biggest problems was that so many victims said, I participated, I, I did the right things, I went to law enforcement, but I never heard anything after that. And their frustration is, is something that we need to make sure never happens again as well. Okay. The other area that we're looking into are economic opportunities and, and equal opportunities for women. One bill that um, I think, I believe the, the caucus is particularly interested in this year is the um, family leave bill, the paid family leave bill. Can you take us through that bill Correct. a little bit? So paid family leave has been a priority for the caucus for some time now. And unfortunately, America and Hawaii is not unique in this. 
but America in general has fallen behind when it comes to taking care of our families. And so this bill would establish a family leave program in the Department of Labor, and it would acquire employers and employees each to contribute to a fund that uh, an employee could use in the case of if they have a newborn or taking care of a sick loved one. And I think that it really is important to make sure that we set up this kind of protection so that people don't have to choose between their jobs and their families. Is this something, is, is this something that other countries have that we don't have, other in modern industrialized countries have paid leave and we don't? Yes, absolutely. If you look at a lot of countries in Europe, they have sometimes up to a year of paid family leave. And we know that time, especially when you're having a young, a young family, is so critical. And it's for mothers and for fathers. Mm -hmm. And so in Hawaii, at least, I think we need to take a look at this legislation so we can keep up with the rest of the world. We've got about actually a little bit over two minutes to talk. And I, and I, I wanted to get to this if we could. Your, the legislative package for women obviously is very important. This has been, I don't know how to explain it, not, the, I don't want to say the year of the woman, but this has been, last year was watershed year for women's issues. It started out with the march, the women's march on Washington. Over the summer, we had the, the sexual harassment complaints against uh, Harvey Weinstein, which resulted in the hashtag Me Too movement. We've got the, the scandal with the U.S. Um, women's gymnastic team. You are a professional woman. You are a legislator. You have a family. I have an intern named Shari Nishijima, who is a sophomore at UH, and she wants to know, um, beyond the hashtag Me Too, the hashtag Not Ever Again, what can we do? Where do we go from here? Where do we go beyond the hashtag movement, in your opinion? I think that's a really good question. I think that's something that a lot of people are asking themselves is, is this going to be the watershed? Is this going to be the moment that changes America and the lives of women everywhere? And I think the answer is it's up to us. And it's up to us to make sure that this isn't just a passing news story, mm -hmm. that we turn it into something real. And I think for, for me as a legislator and, a, and, and, and as a mom, as a caregiver, that's exactly what the bills in the Women's Legislative Caucus package are all about, is turning these ideas and social movements into real change that can affect real people's lives. So to Shari and to her friends, all the other sophomores and juniors and freshmen up at the University of Hawaii and everywhere else, do you, are, do you have some, prat, some um, suggestions for what they can do beyond hashtagging and marching? Absolutely. I'd love to see them run for office. I'd love to see them get involved here at the legislature, whether it's interning or volunteering, submitting testimony, coming down for a hearing. I think it's so important for women to get involved in the political process. Uh, for example, we only have 22 women out of 76 legislators. Well, we know that women make up more than half of the voters in the state. So I think there's a lot that they can do. Okay, well, all you women out there, you heard the rally and the call, so we expect you to all run for office in this coming election year. Thank you, Representative, for joining us, and thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Live at the Legislature is a live half-hour weekly news program that focuses on the issues, legislation, and topics of importance emerging from this year's legislative session. Each week, state senators and representatives provide a variety of perspectives on the issues from both sides of the aisle. Tune in to Live at the Legislature weekly to get exclusive updates on what's happening in Hawaii's legislature. Do you know your legislators? Visit capital.hawaii.gov and enter your street name to find detailed information about your representatives and senators. From your district number to the committees and current bills your legislators have introduced, this is an easy way to stay up to date with what is happening in your community. If you're looking for detailed information concerning Hawaii State Senate and House hearings, please visit olelo.org forward slash gov hyphen archives. Videos are arranged by date with the most recent at the top of the list. Are you looking for an easy way to get involved in the legislative process? 
stop by the public access room located in room 401 at the Hawaii State Capitol. Open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. in session. The public access room provides citizens of Hawaii's facilities, services, and equipment to enhance their ability to participate in the legislative process. The public is welcome to track and affect legislation pending before the Hawaii State Legislature. Aloha and welcome to Live at the Legislature. I'm Jill Kuramoto. And every week we sit down with our Hawaii State Senators to talk about the events and issues that are happening at the Senate. And this morning we have Senator Willis Sparrow. He is the chair of the Senate Committee on Housing. And we also have our vice chair of the Senate Committee on Housing, Senator Breen Harimoto. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Jill. I think if you ask anyone in the public what some of their top concerns are for uh, the state, I think how, how homelessness and housing are going to be at the top of that list and I think we all agree that they're sort of interrelated. Yes. So as chair of the Housing Committee, how do you plan to address affordable housing this session? Well, key to affordable rentals are is to have government subsidies and we need to invest tax dollars in infrastructure and planning and construction. That's what we're going to do at one of our TOD projects, um, Mayor Wright Housing. But millions of dollars over the next 10 years, hundreds of millions need to be invested by the government in order to build the affordable rentals because it's only going to be the state government that's going to drive affordable rentals. Okay, so well, let's talk about uh, another issue about TOD. A recent report by the Hawaii Interagency Council for Transit Oriented Development has identified more than 30 sites on Oahu that could be used for uh, affordable, develop affordable housing along the rail transit line. So how do you plan to move the state forward addressing uh, developing TOD projects? Well, one of the exciting things is that TOD allows us to create these new vibrant communities around rail stations and they will be mixed use, mixed income. And the good thing is that along the rail line, the state is one of the largest landowners. So we're trying to um, be sure that we don't miss this opportunity for affordable housing um, in those developments. And, you know, they have to be public-private partnerships because the state cannot bear the entire cost. Right. Well, I, you know, much of the development may not be able to be completed in five, maybe ten years. So how do you plan to move these projects forward much quicker, much faster? Well, we are in discussion with the county and there are um, state agencies that are working on how can we streamline the process. Um, for example, one area we're looking at is uh, historical properties, uh, those properties with uh, buildings that are 50 years or older and how we could uh, deal with those. We're also looking at the, the approvals with the Department of Planning and Permitting because that's an area where uh, many of the developers say that uh, there's duplication and some unnecessary delays, but it's a collaboration between the state and the uh, counties. But we certainly, as I said earlier, need to put more funds into housing. And one way we're hoping to do is to raise the money through the conveyance tax. Currently, we get 38% from the conveyance tax, which is on real estate sales. And we want to remove that uh, cap of 38 million and uh, percentage from 50% to 60%. And that will alone will raise us millions of dollars that we could put into the um, affordable uh, revolving trust fund and a fund also um, DERF, which is used by developers to assist in their projects. It's definitely a multifaceted problem that requires a multifaceted solution. Yes. Right. Well, let's talk about housing and how also we need to balance natural resources, agricultural land. I know that's something that's important to you, Senator Harimoto. Yes, you know, that's a huge issue. Um, you know, some people think that um, development is a bad thing, uh, but in this case, I think it's a good thing. You know, one of the core values we have in Hawaii, I believe, is keep the country country. And there's a good reason for that. So if we look at the opportunities of rail and TOD, you know, this allows us to densify that urban core, to build these new vibrant communities around the rail stations where people can live, work, and play. And you can get along with maybe 
one car instead of two or three or maybe no cars. And the trade-off is that we can get those housing units in the urban core and save the country. We can keep the country country. Um, and I think that's a really huge trade-off. Yes. And, and a key point to remember is in the next 50 years, Oahu alone may have an additional 300 to 400,000 new residents just in Honolulu. So we're at the tail end of the urban development on the west side where I live. And, and many of the uh, homes will be built out there, but as Senator um, Harimoto said, rail is key to these um, high density projects where people can live, work, play, and go to school. And it's actually gonna be very exciting and vibrant, in my opinion, once that rail is up and running and uh, people are gonna be very impressed with it. Um, although everyone's not happy with the cost because it was lowballed when it was approved, but at this stage, we have to build it. It's halfway done in terms of the, um, the main um, rail. And uh, I foresee and we foresee that it's going to be a huge benefit 20 years from now easily, easily. Okay. Well, I know that last year the legislature appropriated about $50 million towards um, housing and funding for the rental housing de re revolving fund and the dwelling unit revolving fund. And also a significant amount of funds was uh, a appropriated for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to develop homes for their de beneficiaries. And the governor in his State of the State address is asking for another $100 million to address housing. Do you think that's possible to do? Well, I'll start <laughs> off. You know, money is always an issue, but one of the biggest impediments to creating more affordable housing, or housing in general, is a lack of infrastructure, mainly sewers. So in the past, we had these mega developers that could pass the cost along to thousands of homes. And now with rail, we have smaller infill developments that the developers cannot pay. So government needs to step in, get the infrastructure in so that developers can produce housing that we need. Yeah, and personally, I think the $100 million that the governor is asking for is, is not enough. It's too low. Uh, we had a bill last session uh, with a $2 billion bond. Those are the numbers we need to be thinking about if we're going to put a dent in the housing project because um, one development alone can cost over $100 million in infrastructure, as Senator mentioned. And then when you're talking about island-wide or statewide and the neighbor islands, $2 billion doesn't go very far. Um, it could be spent... Um, uh, in a few years easily if we have the political will to do it. And, and we're hoping that we can get a much more than $100 million this year in order to take care of, to end homelessness and then to build some affordable rentals. Well, I know that we could discuss this a lot more. Um, and actually, there is a meeting tonight at the state capitol in the auditorium. 4 o'clock to 5.30. The public is invited. Yes, and we'll be talking about housing and um, some of the bills that we've introduced and get a few comments from the public as well. Uh, we think this is the big issue of the, day, of the day here at the legislature. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for watching live at the legislature. We'll see you next week.